In this video, I'm going to do a simple analysis using the Python programming language and various add-on packages to do a deeper analysis and get more insight into, in this case, the example is going to be looking at the evolution of President Biden's approval ratings uh, up to the present time. Now, this is not a very advanced analysis. It's definitely preliminary and shouldn't be taken too seriously. I am, however, going to use it as an example. I've done some previous videos showing how to do some analysis of the same data using LibreOffice Calc, which is a free open source spreadsheet. It's very, very similar to Microsoft Excel. It's, quote, a clone, unquote, of Excel. It's not quite the same, but it works pretty similarly. Here I'm going to show things you can do in Python that are more advanced than what's at least easily accessible in LibreOffice Calc. Excel, for example, has add-on packages that can add various kinds of fitting capabilities such as are in Python. That you get to a point where the spreadsheets are difficult to work with and you really need to use tools like Python or the R programming languages. Those are both free open source tools. There are tools that cost a lot of money like Mathematica, MATLAB, SAS that are similar to what I'm going to show here. So let's get started. First, I'm going to just show the results of the analysis, and then I will go through the code in some detail, kind of explaining what's going on. All right, so a couple of things. First of all, what version of Python? This is just for clarity. This is 3.8.5. It's not the most recent, but it's pretty close to the recent. I'm using an editor called Emacs, which is kind of not as popular as it used to be. This is Emacs 27.1. So let's go back to the source code and this is a Windows 10 64-bit computer all right so I have a, a script that runs the program and there we go this is as I said Windows is a DOS console here we go okay so I'm gonna go through the results here of looking at it so the the green plus signs are the actual data so the ratings are in percent approval and what I'm curious about is more than just what the plot looks like, but understanding why uh, Biden's approval has dropped. I have a preconceived idea that I'm going to show. And I'm also curious about the question of uh, whether the crisis in Ukraine has produced a boost in uh, Biden's approval rating. So in crises uh, like September 11 or the Cuban Missile Crisis, back in the 60s or briefly for several months after the Iran hostage crisis started in November of 79. Each case, the president at the time got a significant boost, at least 10 percent in their ratings. Uh, that so far has not happened uh, for President Biden, and I'll go through that. So figuring out what causes things like that is difficult. Again, the data is the plus signs, and you can see President Biden is inaugurated right here. This is at the beginning of his term and he's doing okay pretty well better than 50 percent you can see there's a lot of scatter now these are the results from different polls polls often report a few percent error if you compare different polls you often get a much wider spread and there, it's not clear why that happens the results vary depending on how you ask the questions the population that you actually interview or survey for your poll uh, there's a lot of controversy over polls as probably many people are aware polls showed in 2016 that president then candidate trump but trump was going to lose badly to hillary clinton of course that didn't happen there's a long history of the polls not matching up in major ways with election results it, trump is not the first time that happened it happened with reagan in 1980 it happened with president roosevelt way back in the 30s it's happened in some governor and mayor races so polls need to be taken with a grain of salt. You can see there's a lot of scatter here. And it, by eye, if you just look at the data, it kind of looks like it's moving in about the same area up to here, and then it suddenly moves down here. That's what I see. And I think you can see that in this plot pretty well. My theory is this is probably caused by the widespread failure. At this point, we know it's widespread failure of the COVID-19 vaccines to prevent infection and transmission of COVID. That shouldn't be a controversial statement at this point. It's pretty obvious. I know many people who have been diagnosed with COVID who were fully vaccinated 
The vaccination is very popular here in the Silicon Valley. People believe in it very strongly. The people I know are fully vaccinated, et cetera. They're still coming down with it and so on. That's not unusual. Official figures all over the world are showing that the vaccines don't work very well in preventing infection and transmission. The official narrative has, of course, changed to saying, well, okay, all right, there are these breakthrough cases, but it'll keep you alive. You know, you're not as likely to be hospitalized or die. Uh, the percentage of people who are hospitalized or die from COVID is quite low. I don't know a single person in that category out of the hundreds of people that I know. Uh, I have heard of family members of people I know who've died, but in fact, most people who get it certainly don't get hospitalized. They have a bad cold, maybe. A significant number seem to have no real symptoms or minimal symptoms. It's very hard to independently verify claims about its effects on hospitalizations and deaths simply because hospitalizations and deaths, despite the news coverage, are actually clearly quite rare. That could change, of course. So let's take a look at what, what happens here. So I do a couple of things. The, the first thing is if a specific event had an effect, what we would expect is something like the blue line here, which is a threshold model, right? He's going along okay. News of the problem, different people see the problem, but it's fairly localized in time. It'll drop down to a new level. Uh, well, that model agrees okay, 74% agreement with the data. Uh, it's better than a straight line. A line is only 66%. Uh, you know, the, the, the fitting here pretty clearly indicates that we're not seeing just a straight line decline. You know, you know, oil prices are rising. The economy isn't doing very well. So you just get this steady degradation of his performance. You know, the honeymoon wears off, that kind of thing. It really does look like there might have been something right around here that caused a drop. And in fact, something did happen. Uh, the model fitting actually says, this is what I call the threshold. This is the midpoint of my S-curve here. And that's on August 15th. And about two weeks earlier, there was widespread publicity about the Provincetown outbreak, in particular on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. In fact, it was in the news earlier. It's, it was a 4th of July outbreak, so you have to go back a couple more weeks. And so you'd expect as word spreads then people will uh, to be increasingly concerned about the situation. It's worth understanding that this probably reflects some combination of the whatever immunity the vaccine gives is short-lived. It turns out that's not unusual for inactivated vaccines like the COVID vaccines. In fact, it's hard to get the immune system to react to essentially dead viruses or parts of viruses which is what the inactivated vaccines are. The immune system sounds like it's really quite intelligent, and it says, well, the thing is dead. I don't have to worry about it. They put essentially poisons, adjuvants, in the inactivated vaccines to try to trigger the immune system to produce an immune reaction, which sounds like a kind of dicey thing to do to me. What all of that means is it's not actually that surprising that it would wear off after a few months. The virus itself is constantly mutating and will tend to mutate around the vaccines. And finally, a lot of the restrictions were lifted or rolled back in June, back here. So we figure more people are going out, so they're more likely maybe to spread the disease. That's debatable, actually. Uh, if you believe, as I do, that there's, this is probably aerosol, you know, airborne transmission, it's not clear that that would happen. But anyway, there are multiple factors that make it sensible to believe that there might be a slight delay between the vaccinations and realizing, finding out they don't really work very well. And that's likely that that's what happens here. So now you have a lower approval rating because of the failure of the COVID vaccines. Now, the officials, the CDC, especially President Biden, very clearly overpromised back here. Uh, Biden himself actually made statements that if you got the vaccine, you couldn't be infected, which was known to be false, and that you uh, couldn't transmit it. All, not necessarily known to be false. And what I mean by that is the Moderna and Pfizer studies actually included a small number of cases of people who were vaccinated and who nonetheless got sick with COVID. Uh, they were typically claiming that 10 people or something in the control arm, 10, 10 out of, say, a couple hundred arguably people who were vaccinated who did actually get sick compared to around 100 or 200 people in the um, unvaccinated arm of the study who got 
COVID. So on the basis of this, they claimed a 95% quote effectiveness of the vaccines. They weren't perfect from the very beginning, and it was always the case that some people would get the get COVID even though they were vaccinated. But they basically either explicitly stated like Biden did or strongly implied that the vaccines were perfect. And they went through a period, as many viewers may recall, of, of saying, well, these uh, so-called breakthrough infections were rare. No, they really weren't. And now, of course, there are many breakthrough infections. It's very clear that these promises were overstated, to put it mildly. It's not surprising when you overpromise and underdeliver that you get a big hit in your uh, approval rating. So that's my theory. That's what I think happened here. Now, I'm also interested in the question of whether the Ukraine crisis is giving this rally around the flag boost that's often been seen in pre previous uh, presidencies. And the answer is so far, no. The crisis has been going on for about a month. And by some polls, like the NBC poll a few uh, a week ago about, uh, Biden is doing even worse. Obviously, it's much too early. And obviously, an invasion of a country halfway around the world is not the same thing as Pearl Harbor or September 11 or having you know nuclear missiles in Cuba 90 miles from our coast, which gave significant boosts to uh, previous presidents. So there's a lot of caveats here. And clearly, I think it's important to understand this is, is a very preliminary analysis. There's just inherently poor quality to the data from the polling, as you can see from all the scatter and the numbers. Uh, there are unknown problems with polling. And secondly, you would actually want to, and I may do this in future videos and articles, but you may, you probably, to really analyze this, you need a more comprehensive model of what drives presidential approval ratings. So you'd want to look at previous presidents and others and see how the economy, how wars in general and events like that impact it. So then you could sort of look at that model in the Biden case and you would probably have a clearer picture of what's happening here and, and how true the hypothesis that, for example, the failure of the COVID vaccines caused this drop here and also explain why you don't see a boost so far with Ukraine. One other thing I wanted to draw attention to is I use a goodness of fit statistics here, which is called R squared. Um, this is also known as the coefficient of determination. You can look it up on Wikipedia, for example. It's roughly a measure of the percentage of agreement between the model and the data. It's a very good practical engineering goodness of fit statistic because it gives you some sense of what you really care about. In practice, virtually all models, even extremely good models, are imperfect. And you can show with enough data that the model is imperfect. That's because we can't model and understand everything. Even the models that are used in like celestial navigation to land men on the moon or send probes to Mars aren't 100% perfect. What we need is a model that's good enough that we can do safely the thing we want to do. We can get men to land safely on the moon or get our probes to land safely on Mars. The fact that they're off by one in 100,000 or so, those celestial navigation models, is not a showstopper. On the other hand, if they were off by a, even a percent, let alone several percent, let alone the 26 percent here, they would not work. We would miss the moon. You know, the Apollo missions would have failed. All the probes sent to Mars would have missed Mars. You get the idea. What we really want to know in a lot of cases is how good in practical terms is the model? How well does it agree with the data? It does not have to be perfect for engineering purposes, for a lot of real life purposes. If I were an investor, I don't need to have perfect prediction of the future if I'm off by a few percent. If I can identify that stock that one year from now is going to be, you know, shoot up by $100 per share or something like that, I know what to invest in. Let's say it's $10 today and it's going to go up $100. Well, the fact that it might be $99 a year from now or $105 or $90, that, that's not the issue. So long as I, my model is, hypothetical model is good enough, you know, I, okay, it's, it's a minor detail. On the other hand, if my model's way off, if it has, you know, for example, errors more like this, I may not be able to invest for practical purposes. So it depends. So that's an important point. So typically we want the models that have the better goodness of fit. The problem, which is an advanced topic and which is not fully understood, is the more complex you make the models in general, uh, the more terms they, uh, not terms, but the more adjustable parameters they have. So the threshold model has four parameters versus two in the line. As you add these parameters, typically the model becomes more plastic, like a rubber sheet, eventually like uh, plastic wrap, like saran wrap. 
it will literally adjust itself to your data, no matter what data you have. In which case, the agreement, which is excellent, is misleading. It doesn't mean it can predict very well. And you can see this problem shown here by comparing the polynomial here, which has four parameters, just like the threshold model. And it also, as you can see, agrees about the same. However, that is misleading. And it's fairly obvious with a polynomial here because it shoots up as we get into trying to predict the future. Next, if you extrapolate this out a year, President Biden's approval would go over 100%, whereas that would not occur with a threshold model. Now, this is an unsolved problem, how to sort of adjust for this plasticity of the models and how to pick out from models which seemingly have very good agreement, which ones that sort of real agreement, you can really predict the future. This is a very fundamental problem that is very deep. I mean, it gets you into philosophy and metaphysics and foundations of mathematics. You know, I often think of these as kind of uh, far out things that none of us have to worry about. But if you're actually trying to do things like this, predict the future, determine the effectiveness of drugs, uh, actually deeply understand the universe in practically useful ways, you actually get into these problems. I'm not going to talk about that more here because it's pretty advanced and uh, you know, I'm sure would not be of great interest. So that's, in a nutshell, the analysis of Biden's approval ratings, just showing the results. Uh, now what I'm going to do is quit this to finish the program, and it writes out the file to a JPEG image file so I can use it again. So I have the plot available here. So that concludes just showing what the results are. Uh, the next step is to go through the code and explain what the code is. This is the second part where I actually go through the Python code to show you how I produced uh, this plot here. And again, let me actually bring the plot up just to remind people what the plot looked like. And here we go. Again, the green plus signs are the actual approval ratings of President Biden. Zero is the beginning of 2021, and this is the number of days. And just to recap, there's considerable indication of a fairly sharp drop in approval ratings, at least coinciding with the public realization that the COVID vaccines do not prevent transmission and infection. Okay, so let's look at the code that generated this. Okay. Um, so you know, to do an in-depth analysis like this, you usually have to use a programming language. Uh, even in things like Excel, people are often using the visual basic that comes with Excel. So a useful, widely used uh, tool is the Python programming language, which is what I'm using here. I'm using Python 3.8 point. Um, let me just redo this here. Version again, you can see it there, 3.8.5. Python has built-in add-on, built-in modules for various capabilities. Those are imperative here. By itself, its mathematical and statistical abilities are limited. The statistics and math capabilities are added from add-on modules produced actually by separate sort of nonprofit groups or nonprofit groups funded by companies. So NumPy is numerical programming. Pandas is a very useful package for reading and writing files like comma-separated values files, uh, Excel spreadsheets, and various other things. It has a lot of capabilities. It really extends the capabilities of Python. It also has a whole subsystem for dealing with dates and times, which is often a problem. We'll see an example of some of the problems with handling dates and times in this example. Matplotlib is a graphics and plotting program modeled on the plotting capabilities of MATLAB. And SciPy, I'm using it here for an, an optimization or hill climbing algorithm called CurveFit that takes the data and takes a, a function or a mathematical model with adjustable parameters like the position of a peak, the width of a peak, things like that, and figures out the best parameters fitting the data. And also here, uh, this SK Learn Metrics, I import R2 score, which computes the goodness of fit statistic, the coefficient of determination, often known as R squared. And this is a very practical, engineering-oriented goodness of fit statistic that tells you how good the model is. It can loosely be interpreted as the percentage of agreement between the model and the data. So if you had a R2 score here, for example, 0.99, that's 99%. So your predictions, extrapolations, answers are likely 
roughly good to within about a percent in that case. It's actually you're doing quite well with a lot of real world data to get something like a 99 percent agreement. And we don't get that here with this data of President Biden's approval ratings. OK, so we read in the data using the pandas module from uh, this file. This is from the polling report, which is a it's a collection of many different polls. As I mentioned, there's a lot of scatter actually in the results. We pull out the dates and the re approval rating values. Now, the dates at this point are strings. That is, they're character things, and they're actually ranges. Which, and so we need to manipulate them further to get an actual s single date value. And we want that date to be expressed in days since the very beginning of 2021. Here, we go through some mechanics here. We use regular expressions. That's a very technical term to convert these ranges like 318, March 18th through uh, March 21st of 2022, and we just pick the starting value in the range for simplicity. So here I had to go through all this stuff to manipulate the dates and get them into a usable form. This is a very, very common problem in data analysis with Python and indeed all, all the tools. And uh, both Pandas and this date time have more advanced tools, more advanced functions for processing dates, but it's often still a, a time-consuming, tedious step. And we want to predict into the future and see what the models will predict. And in some cases, for example, we can see this really improbable behavior prediction from a polynomial. So when we predict, that can help us sort of say, well, that prediction just isn't realistic, as well as use the predictions that we think are valid. So I have to, by hand, implement uh, three possible models here. That's what these def sigmoid, that's a threshold function that looks kind of like this, like an S-curve, a straight line like a ruler would make. And polynomials make these funny wiggly things, uh, kind of like a snake or something like that. A very simple example of a polynomial is the distance fallen by, um, you know, you drop a billiard ball off of the Empire State Building. The distance it drops from you will go up is proportional to the square of the time. So it keeps going faster and faster. If object accelerates under under gravity, that's a simple example of a very simple polynomial, uh, a parabola that is a real world thing you encounter frequently in everyday life without being that aware of it. So we use this curve fit uh, function to basically uh, figure out these parameters for the model. So for example, the sigmoid or threshold function has what I call a pedestal, which is its sort of starting value. You know, it could be, for example, 50% or something, approval, whatever. Um, there's a gain. It goes up over a period of time, and that period is loosely the dispersion. So it could go up very, very fast. The dispersion could be very small, like one week, or it could be several months, and then it plateaus out uh, afterwards. And we think of the location as the midpoint of that increase or decrease in the threshold function. The point is there are these parameters. We want to figure out exact estimates of values of these parameters, and that's what curve fit does for us. Okay. If you've used the trend line feature in Excel or LibreOffice Calc, it's essentially doing something like this, but it has very limited capabilities compared to curve fit. Okay, it can only handle, for example, it doesn't have built into it, at least in LibreOffice Calc, and I'm pretty sure Excel is pretty much the same. It doesn't have a threshold function, even though, or examples of threshold functions, even though these types of functions are common in uh, science and engineering in the real world. And of course, I believe it probably provides a model of a, the effect of an event uh, such as, uh, you know, bad news, for example, hitting uh, the population on a president's approval rating. Okay, so anyway, to really do this kind of stuff, you usually need these tools. So you need to know something about the programming language. And despite efforts to make these things usable and more intuitive, they're often very picky um, and uh, they don't have a GUI. So you're often looking up like exactly how do I define this? How, how do I call this? Um, they could probably be improved. That's something I'm working on. But the point is uh, you really have to write these programs. And they do automate some of the tasks, but they fail to automate a lot of critical steps in analysis and statistics and so forth that require the judgment of the human being. You know, one of those, for example, is 
guessing what the model might be, whether the sigmoid or something else, figuring out what that could be. Okay, so I do this for the different models, which produces the different line, will be drawn as these different lines. And then down here I have the commands to produce this plot using matplotlib, this plotting uh, module. It's an add-on for Python. And so you can see the features here again. So we have the three lines representing the three models, and I report these goodness of fit statistics. And then I show with these vertical lines key events that I think either probably did have an effect, namely bad news about the COVID vaccines in uh, July and August of last year, of 2021. And then the yellow line represents the Ukraine invasion February 24th of 2022 by Russia. And so far, at least, there's no real sign of a significant effect on Biden's popularity, his, or more properly, approval ratings. So that loosely explains what the code is doing. Now, as I said, this is a preliminary, fairly basic analysis. If you wanted to have a deep understanding of, to the extent that we can come up with that using these tools, using modern mathematics and statistics, to do a really deep understanding of Biden's approval ratings, you'd have to put it in the context of other presidents, the history of approval ratings, and also other factors, inflation, unemployment, measures of war, et cetera, in order to see what's really going on and to what extent you might expect to see this anyway. I don't think you would, but to really maybe be able to confirm might be too strong a word, but say that there's a pretty high probability that the theory that, say, the COVID news is the cause of the parent drop here. You really have to do a more in-depth analysis, which I may show in the near future in another video or a series of articles or something like that. And that concludes this more in-depth exploration of what you can do with Python. This concludes this video presentation. If you like this video, please click like. Please click subscribe and the notification bell if you would like to receive more content from us. You can avoid internet censorship by subscribing directly to our RSS news feed. Please consider sharing the link by email and on your website or blog, in addition to liking, upvoting, or sharing on increasingly censored, advertising beholden, big company social media. We have encountered such censorship. Mathematical software is developing algorithms and software to automate data analysis reducing the risks of costly errors and increasing the predictive power of the results. You can support our work financially by subscribing on our Patreon page, https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash mathsoft, or scanning the QR code in the lower right corner.